Over the last three years, we've mentioned the Cosmosphere a hell of a lot on this podcast. But what is it and why should you go there? Well, today we're going to talk about one of our favorite places. And to do this, we're joined by one of their volunteers. And he's the host of the Space Shop podcast, John Monix. Have you ever been to the Cosmosphere? What did you think about it? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 149 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Listening to the Space and Things podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 149 of the Space and Things podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. I can't believe we're almost at episode 150. That is crazy to me. That is a lot of episodes. Yeah. So we're working on getting our uh, next guest. For the 150th podcast. I hope we get the person. If so, it'll be really awesome. I don't want to spoil it in case we don't get them, but I'm hoping it'll be an awesome <laughs> yeah. show. So I think you guys will want to tune in for that one. Absolutely. But should we do this episode first? I think we should. <laughs> yes, let's let's do this. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So I've been there twice and Emily recently visited. We're talking about the Cosmosphere, a little piece of heaven for space geeks in the middle of America. It was founded by Patty Carey back in 1962 in a tiny town called Hutchinson in Kansas. The museum has grown to become a center which is worthy of any once-in-a-lifetime trip for people like us. I did have a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and then it was so good, I decided to have another once-in-a-lifetime trip. That's how good this place is. Anyway, it's collected a vast amount of artifacts and displays them in a way which makes it impossible not to learn something new with every visit or even just walking around. Every time you walk around, you'll see something different. They also put on some world-class events as Emily and I experienced together in December last year. And they're also named as one of the first affiliates of the Smithsonian Institution back in 98. On top of that, they have a division called Spaceworks, which helps to restore space artifacts. And we spoke about one of these restorations way back on episode 46 when we spoke to the Cosmosphere CEO, Jim Remar, all about the rescue and restoration of Liberty Bell 7, which was the Mercury capsule which took Gus Grissom to space in 1961, which ended up sinking to the bottom of the ocean, where it remained for 38 years. Spaceworks also restored all the consoles for the historic Mission Control in Johnson Space Center in Houston, and it builds props for many of the space movies and TV shows you love. For example, they built the Mission Control set for the Apollo 13 movie. Very cool. Yeah, really awesome. To help us talk more about this museum and why it should be on your list of places to visit, we've asked our friend John Molnix to join us. John is a NASA Solar System ambassador who volunteers for the Cosmosphere, giving tours and creating some amazing content for their social media platforms. He hosts his own podcast called The Space Shot, which has over 400 episodes and is well worth listening to. He also hosts the Cosmosphere podcast, so check that one out too. He is also a jeweler and creates some incredible space-themed jewelry. You'll all want to check out his Starlight and Gleam website to see that. Dave will put links to all things John in the show notes, so go check them out. But right now, let's talk about the Cosmosphere. Houston, this is Space and Things Base here. It's time to crack on. All right. So, hello, John. Thank you for joining us on Space and Things. So, first things first, what started your personal interest in spaceflight? Uh, was there any key event? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Um key event uh, I, I joke with family and friends on this one is uh my mom went into labor with me during an episode of the original series of star trek <laughs> so she waited to go to the hospital until she finished the episode so i think i was kind of doomed from birth yes. to be a little bit of a space nerd um, uh, so, you know, it wasn't any, I guess, specific mission. I remember growing up, uh, with the space shuttle, you know, seeing, I got to see the shuttle on the pad when I was a little kid back, it would have been, oh gosh, 92 or 93. We went to Florida 
just being kind of around all of that. I grew up in my parents' jewelry store. So when I was a kid, I would clean the glass. I would clean up the shop. I would answer the phone and I got paid in a credit at the bookstore that was like next door. So I basically got as many used books as I wanted. Uh, nice. It's really, I think it was those things that kind of doomed me from birth to be a bit of a nerd. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about your writing and your, and your podcast, uh, The Space Shot. So what topics do you enjoy covering and do you have any favorite interviews or programs that you've done? Well, the topics that I like to cover, that's changed a bunch because the first year was cranking out an episode a day for an entire year. Yeah, mental. Before that, like when I was in school, when I was at college, I had a few professors who were kind enough to let me design my own independent study classes and they got to focus on space history, luckily. Um, so for a couple of years, really, I got to do a bunch of reading before I started the podcast. So that helped with like researching those daily episodes and knowing where I needed to go for info. So yeah, that, that first year was just lots of, lots of history. Um, after that, I've really enjoyed doing the science episodes. I know there's one that I got to do for the Cosmosphere that I played on the space shot too, because there's people that don't listen to both. So I try to include the Cosmosphere ones there. Oh gosh, it was with, I think it was Kelsey Singer and Joel Parker, and they are two of the scientists on the New Horizons mission. Nice. And we were talking about cryovolcanoes <laughs> and that, that entire concept, like I've been reading, I've been on a big reading kick lately for like geology and stuff like that, but just the processes that would do, you know, like volcanism, but instead of like magma, it's ice just kind of blows my mind even now. So the science episodes are a lot of fun. My favorite interview overall, I think was with Tori Bruno. Amazing. He is United Launch Alliance CEO, the most down to earth guy I think I've talked to in the industry and just kind of a normal everyday kind of guy is the, the vibe that I got from him when we were chatting. Was he wearing a cowboy hat when you were talking? I've seen him in a cowboy <laughs> hat before, but he did not have, we were in his office. So there was no okay. cowboy hat uh, inside there, but just a super, super stand up guy. I think that's probably my one of my favorite interviews to this day was with Tori. Yeah, that's very cool to, to be able to interview a CEO of a company that big as well. Who's, that, that, that's a little special, terrifying. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, especially going into his area as well. Being yeah. like, It's one thing doing something on Zoom, but being in their space where they're the power person is a, is a different vibe, I guess. Let, I, I want to talk about this one episode a day. What on earth made you think that was a good idea? Oh, I mean, oh, you did it extremely well. I'm not saying it was badly executed. It was very well executed. But we do one a week and it's a nightmare. Oh, I was single at the time. <laughs> that definitely helped. Um, I was living in the middle of nowhere, South Dakota. And when I say the middle of nowhere, it was Pierre, or as the rest of the country would say, Pierre, um, the capital of all places. And it was like, I think there's 15,000 people there. It's like the second smallest state capital in the country. Wow. And there was nothing to do. It was go to the bar, shoot pool, get drunk, or stay at home, read, and do a podcast. And I suck at pool. <laughs> so I'm not much of a drinker. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm a space nerd. I've done all this like reading in school when I was in college. Why don't I do a podcast? And I was actually with my mom in Nebraska. And we were driving around in the car and that's when I decided I'm going to do a podcast a day for an entire year. I was a little bit mental, I think, starting that, but it was, it was worth it. Um, it helped open up a lot of doors. My wife, when we first started dating, um, she was like, she actually listened to it. So that was kind of a cool way for <laughs> nice. her to get to know me too. Yeah, very cool. Uh, and did you pre-plan it all or was it as you were going along, you, you came up with what you were going to do? How far ahead were you working? Oh God, at any given time, I tried to be a couple days ahead. Wow. There was times where I would slip up and like, if I didn't have a day off or if I was working a little bit more, I, I would get a little behind. Um, but anytime I had like PTO, I would, I would always try to get ahead. The first thing I did that, like basically the planning weekend, when I sat down to start doing everything was just looking through NASA articles, 
I, I hate to say it, Wikipedia, it's a great place to start for research. It's definitely not the be all end all of research, but for finding links to other historical resources or anything like that, it's a, it's a great jumping, you know, jumping off point. The, the first thing I did was just basically going through and coming up with a calendar. Here's January, February, March. I actually started because I started in uh, May. So I started like mid year and I went through. Um, and completed the calendar. I've actually still got it in a OneNote folder. I was looking at it this morning. What calendar, you know, what events that we have that are coming up that I need to start thinking about. And then um, at one point I even did a calendar. It was a, just a big pain to get everything manually input. So I don't know if I would ever do that again. Uh, but like the physical printed calendar was fun. Um, but yeah, planning, I, for, I forget the exact the exact time, but it was something like six hours a day, basically on average. Mm. Some days were more, some days were less, obviously, but about six hours a day. That's wow, crazy. I can't believe you did that for a year. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> so now let's discuss the Cosmosphere. Uh, we're a little biased, but we love the museum. So what brought you there? And why do you think the museum manages to say to stay uh, so accurate and appealing. Um, so I've been in sales basically my whole life. A, a lot of what I do now is like training, um, for like sales people. So for me, when I reached out to the Cosmosphere, it was a cold email. I was just like, Hey, here's what I do. Would you guys like to have a podcast? And thankfully, uh, Mimi and everybody at the Cosmosphere was like, Oh my gosh, that sounds cool. Tell us more. Um, so I'm one for one on uh, cold emails <laughs> for that. So that that's kind of how it started. Then COVID happened. Things kind of took a back burner. Uh, and we're slowly getting back into the swing of things now that my wife and I moved out to Wichita. So we're about an hour drive from the Cosmosphere as opposed to me being in Colorado when I first started doing the podcast, which was logistically a little bit tricky. Thankfully, you know, we could record everything remotely. But being out here now, it's just it's enabled a little bit easier coordination with everybody. And then for like the second part of the question, I know for like the accuracy, that's something that Jim, that Shannon, um, Jim's the CEO at the Cosmosphere, Shannon, um, she's the curator. That's just a big focus is making sure they're telling the accurate story of the space race of space exploration, even when, you know, it's a little bit darker chapter, like the, the new German, the V2 gallery. It's, it's a sobering experience reading through all of that material there, um, mm -hmm. knowing what went in to make the V2. And I guess it's kind of like the dual use nature of anything for, you know, rocket related. They could be used for a weapon of war or they could be used to, you know, go out to Pluto like New Horizons and, you know, discover there's cryovolcanoes out in the outer solar system. So it's that tension between peaceful and military use of space, I think they, they do a really good job of showing both sides of that and not trying to gloss over a darker chapter. Yeah, not trying to gloss over, you know, thousands of people dead. Yeah, well, I mean, more people more people died making the V2 than were actually killed by it, which is just... Yeah, crazy. That tack just kind of blows my mind. On a personal note, I was very impressed that the museum did that. It was sobering. Yeah. The way you put it, you said sobering. I think that's the best way to to characterize it, but I'm glad they did it. Yeah, me too. I, I think that's one of the real standout things about this museum. Now, was the Cosmosphere a part of your life before you started working with them? Does it go way back to your childhood? How does this fit in? So my, my uncles and I were actually talking about this. I gave a tour to some of my family earlier this week. Oh, nice. And... When we first went there, I will send you guys the pictures, but basically I've been going there since I was a little kid because my mom is from McPherson, which is about a 25 minute drive from the Cosmosphere. Wow. Cool. So when I was a little kid, we would visit there all the time. I remember seeing Liberty Bell 7 um, and Apollo 13 when they were being worked on. I'm pretty sure both of them were being worked on. I saw both of them. Um, so seeing the restoration process of both of those capsules before they were actually put on display. Wow. And one of my uncles was telling me that there's a picture of us sitting on the hatch because they used to have Odyssey displayed a different way, I think. And we were sitting on the hatch, but it was like encased in plexiglass still, but like sitting on the hatch to Odyssey. Wow. And I, I have to find that picture. I have 
a whole bunch of family photo albums that I need to scan through in my spare time. And I think that picture is in there, but I, I've been going since I was a little kid. For me, the Cosmosphere has been a part of my life as long as I can remember. So being able to be a volunteer there is super cool. That is awesome. It's still, I mean, like every time I walk into the museum, I've been there hundreds of times and it's still like, well, there's the Blackbird as we walk in or there's Odyssey or I'm in the White Room again. It's still, it never loses its wow factor for me, which is like, okay, that's cool. I need to keep coming. Yeah, especially then when you have moments like we did in December where you're standing next to Odyssey and Fred Hayes is also standing there, which is mind-blowing. That was fun. Yeah. I, I felt so bad for that because Fred is, if he could just, you know, if I could add him as a grandparent, I totally would because he's just that cool. I felt bad trying to keep the line moving there because I, I guess I was kind of the bouncer, as it were, for that event and just trying to keep people moving. And Fred just wanted to talk to everybody. And I felt so guilty trying to keep that line moving so everybody could get through. But just being able to hear him interact with people all day. Yes. is just uh, the, the best guy. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. He, he really is. So <laughs> I'm going to pivot a little bit. So you recently helped the, put together the Cosmosphere's new Skylab exhibit. So tell us about your choices in the exhibit and why the museum insisted on a Skylab event, thankfully. And, and I was very glad to be part of that event. Yes, that was that was a blast. For like for the, for the exhibit, Shannon did an amazing job because she knows exactly what the Cosmosphere had for you know, artifacts, for models. And Dave, I know it's a little tricky, but you should try to get back out before that, you know, before the end of the year. <laughs> to see that yourself. If I must. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cool process, you know, working with Shannon, working with Mimi on that and trying to distill the launch of the, of Skylab and then the three crewed missions down to 700 ish words. For me, I like to talk a lot. <laughs> so that was interesting. And, you know, I, I can be a little verbose, um, trying to trim that down to something that you know a grade school kid could read and understand of course, yeah for the non-space nerds among us it must be good but it was a, it was a really cool experience being able to to work with shannon and mimi on that as for the event the cosmosphere has done a lot of events over the years um mm -hmm. i know for apollo 8 the earth rising event was phenomenal there's supposed to be something for Apollo 13 and then COVID kind of messed up all those plans. Um, and then more recently, the first and last steps of it, they know how to throw a party that's space themed. Uh, so getting everybody out here for an event, even if it's not like a party, if it's just an event celebrating a mission, they do a great job getting people out for it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still kind of pinching myself. Did that, did that happen? So being able to be involved with that was really cool. It was uh, definitely enjoyable. All right. So you talked a little bit about Odyssey, but do you have any other favorite uh, exhibits or artifacts at the museum? And what's the story behind the artifact? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> Hard question. It's like, which uh, favorite kid? We don't, our first kid's on the way. So, you know, I know I'm not going to be able to play favorites, but, you know, like <laughs> which kid is your favorite is kind of like how this question feels. The Luna 2 Impactor is really cool. Um, and I like that just because there's a fun bit of trivia with that one. The Luna 2 Impactor, for those who may not know, it's like a little, it kind of looks like a miniature soccer ball because there's all these little panels put together and it has basically the Soviet Union and the date that they hit the moon. And then when they would go on the moon, a little charge on the inside would like blow up and send these little pieces like all over the moon. And it was basically the Soviet just kind of like dibsing <laughs> that area, I guess, as, as it were. Um, there's two of the replicas of that in existence. Um, and I always like ask this question on like the tours that I give, if anybody knows where both of those are, we have one at the Cosmosphere and then there's another and everyone is always just kind of blown away by the other ones in Kansas of all places. Both of them ended up in Kansas. Um, but the other ones at the Eisenhower museum in Abilene, uh, because Khrushchev gave those as like a gift and it was kind of rubbing our nose in it. Kind of, you know, nan -nan a boo boo. <laughs> we, we got to the moon uh, first with that kind of the political history, that kind of stuff. It's that's what I kind of nerd out about. So that's one of my favorites. 
As for other artifacts, the White Room is amazing. I know there are, in Space Hipsters, there have been very detailed dives into what missions everybody thinks that White Room was used for. And for those who may not know, the White Room is basically the last spot on Earth that an astronaut would step in before they climbed into their Apollo capsule to go to the moon. The one that the Cosmosphere um, has is also signed by Gunter Vint, uh, who's the pad leader. Pretty cool seeing Very his signature cool. on that. Shannon always jokes that we don't know what missions the White Room was used for, but all it's all the good ones. <laughs> so, you know, like 8, 11, 13. <laughs> well, we'll just, we'll claim it for those. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So that that's definitely a favorite. One that's not on display, in, and you got to see this when you were out there for the Skylab exhibit, was a baseball, which doesn't really, you don't think that would have anything to do with space, but it was a baseball that was signed uh, by the crew of Apollo 1 shortly before um, they passed in the fire. Wow. Um, and it was, a, I think it was a pitch, for, the ball was a pitch from Sandy Koufax. I am not a baseball nerd and my dad's probably going to listen to this and be like, oh my gosh, you should know this. <laughs> the ball had something to do with Sandy Koufax. How does that end up at the museum? So somebody, the, the person that got their signatures, I guess, saw the astronauts when they were like eating lunch or something. Emily, do you remember what Shannon said on that one? I think they were like eating lunch or something and this guy had them sign the ball. Yeah, I think it was a story like that. Basically, they were, you know, eating lunch, but it was very shortly before the accident, like days or something like that. Like basically, it, yeah. it could have been one of the last things that they signed. Yeah. Wow. And that's just an interesting, like, historical little, uh, you know, tidbit. But I guess, you know, what, how it ended up at the Cosmosphere. And everybody always asks, like, why all of this stuff ended up at the Cosmosphere. Um, it was Patty Carey. She is, did incredible things, you know, with the planetarium first and then making the Cosmosphere into the institution that it is today. Um, it goes back to her. So, you know, why not the Cosmosphere? I, I do love that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, if, if anybody was going to get it, it's, you know, I'm glad that it's here because it's within an hour drive of me and I'm a little bit spoiled <laughs> with that. It certainly is probably the most asked question of people about the Cosmosphere, right? Why? How how, and why? And and yes, you had this fearless, fearless leader, I guess, who just put it all together yeah. and, and that, that's carried on. Do you know much about the Smithsonian connection and, and, and what that means and how that came about or is that not something you're I know there's a Smithsonian affiliate um I don't know exactly like how all of that came about I also know that the Cosmosphere is the only place with a privately owned spacecraft because Liberty Bell 7 I 99% sure here is it's considered like ocean salvage right so okay. the Cosmosphere actually owns Liberty Bell um so it's there right now it's been there the last few months but that 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 kind of connection with the Smithsonian, um, I know they have a lot of stuff that's on loan. They get you know sent between museums. A lot of the film, the the display with all the cameras and the the film canisters. I think one of those um, cartridges is actually back in DC now. One of the Apollo eight ones. I think it was the. Um, related something related to Earthrise for that yeah, we, one. Yeah, we heard that as well when we were talking to to Teasel. I, th oh, I think it was Teasel we spoke to about it, and she said that they they realized that that was the Earthrise camera or the Earthrise canister or whatever it was, and they realized you guys had it, and no one knew it was it it, it was them found, and they were like, we should probably be put this with our display over here, <laughs> but it was uh, I. That yeah, that it's actually now that you mention it, that that canister is, or that um, cartridge is miss or it's not, it's not missing, but it's not it's at not the, on the Cosmosphere display. anymore. Yeah. So it's not on display anymore. So that makes sense. <laughs> and that actually reminds me, another another one of my favorite artifacts down there is uh, one of the cameras. It's one of the Hasselblads. It's the only camera that they know of that went to the lunar surface and returned to Earth. So one of those was used during Apollo 14. Normally they would leave the camera like itself behind to save weight so they could have more science payload. But for whatever reason, that camera stayed on board, returned to Earth. So it was actually the camera that was taking, one of the cameras taking pictures on the surface of the moon is now in Hutchinson. 
That's crazy, isn't it? That's crazy. So the the American artifacts, I I tend to understand how they can end up at any museum in America. I, I understand how that might work. To me, the thing that surprises me is things like Luna Luna Two, as you said, and the backup Sputnik. How the hell does that end up in Kansas? That that to me is is perhaps a bigger question because I would expect that to be in a Russian museum somewhere or, or some kind of. So- past Soviet country, but for that artifact, the backup for Sputnik to not be in Russia blows my mind. It's something that I've talked to Jim about before. Um, I don't remember his exact, you know, the exact quote that he had on it, but basically it was just kind of the right place, the right time after the fall of the Soviet union, they were, they needed money. Um, I think that's how a lot of those things ended up happening um they were able to be in the right place at the right time thanks to all the work that patty carey did to set the museum up and it was one of those things that was again like why not you know they had everything that they needed to do to get it out there and that's you know that's how they ended up out in hutchinson of all places yeah and 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 this goes back to what was said earlier the the great thing about the museum is it does show both sides of what space exploration and the space race was and you can't do that unless you have artifacts from both sides and they're so equally well presented uh, without judgment as well in various places which I like it just presents the facts and and, and the artifacts yep. so well and uh, yeah I, I, I mean I just I find it so compelling to walk around because it tells that story so well and it does and it's it's cool with how the museum set up just being able to see like both the American side and then the Soviet side, just kind of side by side almost. The other thing too, is it's the largest collection of Soviet era artifacts outside of Russia. Oh, wow. Um, last time I knew is on display at the Cosmosphere. So it's just incredible collection. And if you, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't been to the Cosmosphere yet, this is my pitch to get out there. You know, if schedules align, I am happy to give a tour you can give me a little bit of notice on like a weekend or something like that i am always happy to take fellow space nerds on tours of the cosmosphere so uh just you know let me know that's my pitch for that um and let me tell you a a john molnick's tour of the cosmosphere is well worth it i've done it i've uh, done it yes yes yeah same here you you gotta do it it's really awesome it was nerve-wracking giving a tour to you guys i'm not gonna (laughs) lie why (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I had a wonderful time. It was it was uh, it was it was awesome. I, it was I, it was really wonderful. Oh, I'm glad I didn't you know mess up anything too bad. <laughs> no, no, at all. no, not that I <laughs> none, not that I was. If you made a mistake or did anything, uh, I was not aware of it. So it was very okay, awesome. Good. I had a I had a wonderful good, good, time. Good. I recorded all of it. Um, and I keep meaning to go through it with a sign tooth comb and send you a grade, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> Let me know. Let me know. <laughs> Maybe one oh, day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So how do you see as a volunteer, the museum adapting to future space projects and new space, you know, as these programs just keep on growing and, and you know, going? Um, yeah, That's what's so wild is like right now, there's a lot of people like, oh, we the golden age of space flight has already passed, you know. But like really what we're seeing now with the Artemis program, with what SpaceX, Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada, Virgin Glass, I mean, like there's so many companies that are you know, that are building the capability to get humans to space or get humans to the moon. It's gonna be really interesting to see what the museum looks like twenty or thirty years from now just because so much is changing so fast there for, you know, like the first season of the pot of my podcast, I was covering SpaceX launches. Cause there was like maybe once a month, once every few months. And now there's like one a week. I can't, I, I don't have the time for that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I feel bad. Like I can't even cover all those launches anymore because the cadence is just picked up so rapidly that it's, it's hard to keep track of everything. Like the Euclid mission launched, what was it a week or so ago? Yeah, And I didn't catch that until after the fact, I'm ashamed to admit, like there's so many things happening right now. It is hard to keep track of all of the missions, how that's going to play out at the museum. I know they're working on a lot of fun things, nothing public yet. Um, but they just finished up redoing the German, the V2 gallery, 
redoing the whole entryway where like the X-15, you know, like the little model of the X-15 is, where the model of the Bell X-1 or the, the scale model of the X-1, um, where Joe Ingalls' suit from the X-15 is at. Um, they just re redid a lot of those exhibits and thankfully that, you know, replacing the older backlit panels, which at this point are 20, 25 years old, some of them wow. are fading. So they thankfully went through, updated those. Um, I know the, there's plans to continue doing that through the rest of the museum, what that looks like for future space. I know there's, there's a lot of stuff I would love to see and hopefully, you know, I can be involved with that, um, and help them out as, as I can. Um, but I, I'm excited, you know, knowing kind of where they're going in that, you know, general direction. I'm excited for the next few years just because it's going to be a fun time at the museum and then also just for space enthusiasts like us. Yeah, it almost feels like you need to have two museums now, doesn't it? Like a building that contains everything up to the space shuttle and then just a whole new building that you just can keep messing around with as new things come and go because you've got that first era of space flight let's, let's call that up until 2011 yeah. covered so beautifully you don't really want to lose any of that because it's so good but there's so much going on and as you say the sheer quantity i mean we, we had the same thing when we started doing this podcast three years ago uh, we'd do a rundown of what launches there were every week and it just became so ridiculous and we weren't covering anything and i was like we, we can't keep doing this because it just doesn't make any sense uh because there was just too much going on the, there really is <laughs> i don't think they would be opposed to it you know, i was just like quadrupling their floor space but you know the funding all of that stuff that that's definitely something they have to keep in mind i i'm sure whatever they end up doing you know they're going to make sure it's within the budget that they can you know all all that fun stuff all the the boring <laughs> money part you know if money was no object what would we want to do you know but yeah for the future especially just so much has changed that it's kind of hard to do a museum piece on some of these things now just because there's so much in flux the history it sounds silly to say but like the history is being written right now like it's not a trite you know little statement like we're literally writing history with what's happening with artemis with what's going to happen with gateway with what's going to happen with the end of the international space station there's so much in the next oh, yeah. few years that it's kind of hard to come up with anything right now until it's a more definitive history of Here's the end date. You know, at least we had that with shuttle because we're, what, 12 years since the last launch here? And like, what, a week or two weeks was the final? It was 12 years ago, I think. Yeah. And yes. That's kind of like how like, we were talking about the Skylab 50th when you guys were out. And it's like, oh, yeah, no, the 50th anniversary is next year because this was last December. And it's like, holy cow, that just totally snuck up on us. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with those future missions and how how commercial crew is remembered of course how cargo there's there's a lot of important stuff that's happened in the last 10 years yeah it's also i guess in terms of a museum you, capturing people's interest when apollo 13 the movie came out i'm sure there was an influx of people wanting to go to space museums For right because sure. there's suddenly a whole new interest in the apollo program it's easy when something's happened in the past but if someone comes in going i want to learn about artemis or I just saw the Artemis 1 launch and I'm fascinated by Artemis, you may not have a display ready for that because it's happening now. So how can you do that? It's, it's a tough dilemma for any museum to have, isn't it, when there's so much going on right now, which is bringing people into a museum and making people excited. And they do, they do have some incredible resources online. Um, the Launch Next website is great for school yeah. kids. So there's a lot of things, you know, like that you can do digitally that you can't necessarily do in like a physical museum. Definitely. I'll make sure you guys get the link for it. But launchnext.org uh, um, has some great resources, short little videos, um, things that just you, you, you can't put in four walls, but thankfully can exist on a website. So that definitely helps out with that. Absolutely. Right. It's awesome. Uh, you and I have, John, have, have spoke about the idea of doing a whole episode on 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 jewelry and and space jewelry. Yes, uh, and maybe one day we'll get round to that if you if because I appreciate that it requires some research. But let's at least talk about what you do because you have this sure. wonderful little business which I think is amazing called Starlight and Gleam, and the website's amazing and you've got some amazing well, little you. little <laughs> items on there. So you mentioned the jewelry shop that you grew up in. So. 
explain how you end up making jewelry and and what kind of stuff you do and why our listeners might love it because they will so um my dad was a self-taught or still still does it a self-taught jeweler they opened a shop in colorado it would have been 1991 it was right before my sister martha was born i grew up in the shop i think i started polishing when i was you know, polishing pieces on like the buffing machine when i was probably five or six um answering the phones doing the you know cleaning the glass all that stuff um but it was really it was right around high school that i started doing the bench work and by bench work i mean like ring sizing setting stones soldering chains retipping prongs like all of that stuff so that's been my career now side hustle now but i've been doing that for close to 20 years at this point that being said during that entire time i was also doing sales I got out of the family business just because it was one of those things that I had, I, I was managing the day to day of that when my parents went through a divorce. They're a lot better now, but basically I needed to get away. That's yeah. why I took a job, I moved to Fargo and then in North Dakota and then moved to South Dakota after that. But basically, you know, for me, the jewelry stuff, I, I've come back to it you know, because it's a fun, creative outlet. Yeah. For me, it's, I don't want to lose those skills, the, you know, the, the, the hand-eye coordination that's required, just being able to take a piece of metal and, you know, form it into something that people can wear as jewelry is a lot of fun. Just recently, I, oh, yeah, the pocketbook didn't like this, but, uh, I got a hand engraving set up. It's called a pulse graver. But basically, it will allow me to do hand engraved. It's machine assisted, but still, you know, doing it by doing everything by hand for engraving, for fancy types of stone setting. So like the stuff that I'm doing on Starlight and Gleam right now is totally different than what I'm going to be doing in the next few months. Oh, wow. Um, the acrylic pieces, I'm probably going to move away from completely just because those it's cool. It's laser etched. It's laser cut. Um, but I'm going to be moving into more just hand hand created pieces nice um, actually later today after we finish up this podcast i'm going to head over uh, to the workshop um i did a whole uh, there's a setting video that i'm learning how to do it's called star setting so it's basically cutting with a graver these really bright cut star shapes around stones wow so i gotta go get some practice oh, wow. in later today before my vacation from my day job is done so <laughs> Oh man, that, that sounds amazing. That sounds really amazing. It's a lot of that fun. That sounds cool. Okay, John, thanks so much for joining us and talking about the, the Cosmosphere and your other interests and the other things that you do. Thank uh, you guys, yeah. Really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll have yeah, you on again you. to talk about other things. Uh, this has been a lot of fun and uh, we'll speak to you very, very soon. Sounds good. We'll, we'll have to do that thank jewel you. space jewelry episode. So Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, thank you guys. Absolutely. <laughs> space and Things Podcast. Launching from your favorite podcast platform every Thursday. John Molnix is one of my favorite people in the whole world, and I'm so glad we had him on this podcast, and I'm sure we will again. Oh, yeah. If you haven't, if you haven't listened to his podcast, go and do it. They're really good. But he's just such a lovely man. And when I was at the Cosmosphere in December, and I met him for the first time in real life, and had a tour with him of the Cosmosphere, it was just so wonderful. He's just so wonderful to be around, especially in that environment where he's talking through what excites him and teaching you things. I, I learned so much from him and his uh, enthusiasm is infectious and that's just amazing. So uh, for, for me, the Cosmosphere encourages people like him to be involved because it's such a good place. It makes the best people want to be there. And I think that's the ultimate compliment you can pay to a place that it draws in people of John's calibre to volunteer. Yeah. And John writes a lot of their social media posts. If you follow the Cosmosphere, and it's worth doing even if you you can't get to the museum, if you follow their page on Facebook, when there's historic stuff going on, there's often a big post about it on their page about the history of what's what it is. Really informative, but... At any level, it's easy to access. And 
He writes most of those posts. There may be other people involved. I'm not sure, but I know he does a hell of a lot of them, if not all of them. And during the Skylab anniversary so far, he's written so many great little things for the Cosmospheres social media, which have been really cool. So as the 50th anniversary of Skylab continues, it's worth following the Cosmosphere on social media just to learn the stuff that John has researched uh, and puts on on the social media of the Cosmosphere. And again, he could be doing that on his own stuff, but he he's doing it for the Cosmosphere because he knows how much people love the Cosmosphere and, and he wants to help the Cosmosphere because it's such a great place. I mean, I, as I said, I yeah. can't think of a better compliment to a place than that, that they can harness the volunteering power of someone like John. And I think that's, as I said, the biggest compliment I can pay, both to John and to the Cosmosphere, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it made it made perfect sense. Um, I just went to the Cosmosphere for the first time in May for the uh, Skylab event, uh, which we did with David Hitt, who's also been a guest on our show. And I had the most spectacular time. You just walk in and the first things you see are the Liberty Bell 7, and you see the SR-71, and it was just like, wow, you know? It's like the minute you walk in, you're like, oh, my God, you know, this is incredible. Like, it's really awesome. And then, I mean, just you got Odyssey, you got, I think, Gemini 10, yeah, and not just the spacecraft. You know, you got just artifacts you're not going to see anywhere else. The thing I like about the Cosmosphere is it manages to be sort of populist. It has the popular spacecraft. You know, it has Odyssey, you know, it has a Gemini spacecraft. It has Liberty Bell 7. Stuff like that. You know, if you love aviation, it's got the SR-71. It's got stuff that's real popular, but it also has the stuff that's, like, more intimate. Like, you know, Ron Evans wasn't a famous astronaut, but it's got his spacesuit. And that's somebody, you know, that we just don't know as much about because he he died really young. You know, and you got the, the camera exhibit. Yeah, the camera exhibit's really cool. Uh, lo- loads of different cameras that were used in the early space program. And it's got the missions they were used on. Loads of them are signed by yeah. people who use them, which is adds another level. What what they've got, as you said, they've got the, they've got the set pieces in there. They've got the big set pieces, as you said, the spacecraft, yeah. and even the space suits, and, and you know the white room, which we discussed in the in the interview. But then they've got a lot of smaller personal items, which make it a little bit more personal and easier to relate yeah. to. Like they've got the dimes that. Gus Grissom had in his spacesuit for the Liberty Bell 7 mission. And it's little yeah. things like that which help... The slide rules. Yes, the slide rules. Little things that connect can connect you to people as a human. And I think that's the stuff that also adds so much to it. And as we said in the interview, the, the connection between the two different space programs of the space race and comparing and contrasting what they were doing, they've got a, a, a big Vostok spacecraft i'm not sure if it's a rat i think it might be a replica i'm not sure but it's it's there and so you can see that and compare that to a gemini capsule which is almost right next to and seeing that contrast of oh okay that's what alexei lanoff did his space walk out of and that's what ed white did his the, the kind of thing that ed white would have walked out of and seeing those things next to each yeah. other you don't see that very often in many space museums yeah exactly for for a place is that's in the middle of nowhere I get in trouble for saying it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's in. It certainly feels for for us UK people. It, it's it's more remote. It's, it's certainly remote, but but yeah, I, I got told off by by someone in the comments when oh, I mentioned gosh. the middle of nowhere before. I've driven there twice, and it's it's a long way from anywhere. Yeah, if you haven't been there before, um, if you fly into Wichita, it's roughly about I think forty five minutes out of Wichita. It's a, it, yeah, you just drive uh, straight there, so it's a. I, it's not in a major city, you know. It's not in Washington yeah, D.C. Exactly. or you yeah, know, or New York, something like or that. Los but, Angeles, yeah, or even Houston. Exactly, but you know, it, it's it's well worth the visit. I mean, if you can get out there, just I, I highly recommend it. It's amazing, and I'm hoping to go again. I love it. I had I had the best time there. I could just spend days just walking around there, and I honestly think you need a couple of days. Like you don't, I don't think one day is going to do it for you. Like you need. A few days to walk around there. When I first went, I was there for just a couple of hours. And I agree, that's why I really wanted to go back. And then when I went back, I was there across two days. And it was interesting to go. And and especially having the tour was really useful because that that highlighted a few things I hadn't necessarily noticed uh, or appreciated the importance of. Because 
I, I guess a criticism is is almost too much in there. Uh, I, that's a, a nice criticism to have. To have that many things that are in there, it's hard to sometimes take it all in. But but yeah, that it, it is worth spending time there. And the thing is, when it is in a remote location, you might as well spend an overnight stay there. There's some great barbecue around there. There's some great little bars in the town. Yes. There's there's plenty of reasons to stay overnight. There's a there's a big salt mine museum as well for those people who are interested in that kind of thing as well nearby, which everyone raves about. I haven't done it, but everyone raves about it. Um so that's cool. And and for those of those of you who aren't American, it's certainly going to a place like this is a very American experience. It feels like a real American experience rather than a tourist trap American experience. As you're driving around, it feels like you're on a movie set, which is pretty cool. I agree. Hutchinson is like that. It's it's real Americana. Absolutely. Absolutely is. That's the great way of, of, of putting it. So yeah, you should you should try and get there if you can. And, um, and Johnny's amazing. And, and as we said earlier, I will put all things John in the show notes. Check out his little side hustle, his little jewelry making. It's so cool. Uh, and, and he's about to have a baby. So why not Why not treat yourself and, and help him out? Because yes. I'm sure he'd, he'd, uh, right now he could really appreciate all the sales that he gets. Um, congratulations, John, and, and your partner on that as well. That's going to be a very exciting time in your life. Um, but oh, one thing we didn't even yes. mention, John got... John had his wedding reception at, at the Cosmosphere as well. Imagine having your wedding yes. photos next to Apollo 13. I mean, that's what you want, right? That is freaking awesome. That is really cool. Anyway, John also said that there's, uh, he's going to be putting up uh, a lot of the material that was recorded for the the Skylab event that Emily was a part of very soon. It's going to be going up over the next few weeks. There's going to be various things going on. So keep an eye out on the, the Cosmosphere socials for that as well. And there's going to be a couple of very cool giveaways, um, some really cool stuff, a couple of signed books and some other, other cool swag. So definitely keep your eyes peeled out on the Cosmosphere socials for that kind of stuff. And as we see it, we'll share it as well. As always, check the show notes. And if you want to see the full unedited interview with John, you can watch that video on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. Past to present, Sputnik to Starship. This is Space and Things. So, Emily, what has caught your eye in spaceflight this last week? A couple things. So uh, last week, the B612 Foundation uh, unveiled the uh, Schweikert Prize to uh, recognize, and this is directly from the press release, contributions to the field of asteroid defense. Uh, And it it was, and this is again from the press release, launched to honor Apollo 9 astronaut Russell Rusty Schweikert through his uh, commitment and a fitting tribute to his lifetime of leadership. So uh, there's a little picture of him with the prize. Uh, It's pretty awesome. So I think this award is going to give uh, $10,000 a a year to a a young researcher, I believe, in the area of uh, studying asteroids or uh, planetary defense and stuff like that. So Rusty was a guest on our show a few weeks back, as many of you may remember. I was kind of wondering, like, man, when are they going to come out with something to honor him? Like to, you know, to sort of like honor uh, his contributions and what he's done for the last 60 years or so you know and and they did something so i think that's awesome so congrats rusty and um also uh, on a not as happy note uh this morning i found out that um one of our space hipsters uh i probably am not pronouncing his name correctly in australia peter uh al ward passed away this week i guess he'd been fighting cancer he had a career i believe at uh, virgin as a uh cabin personnel on aircraft and uh he was a really big figure in australian space he did a lot of uh i think his most recent thing was he did a big interview with joe Kerwin, who we've had on our show before and he did a lot of things in australia to you know sort of keep their contributions to space flight alive which i think is awesome because australia does have a big space background many wouldn't believe it but they do so um, yeah. I just wanted to basically say I, I hope he rests in paradise. I will miss him terribly. He was a friend of mine, and he was a really wonderful person. I'm sort of in shock today. We sent our deepest condolences to all his family and all his friends, and uh, we hope uh, he rests in paradise. He was a wonderful guy, and he'll be missed terribly. So 
that's really all I've got this week. Yeah, there was some wonderful photos put on Space Hipsters of him yeah. at various space events over the, over the years uh, today, and um, I think he will be missed greatly. Yeah, very sad news. Yeah. So, uh, Dave, what have you been looking at this week? Well, launches. Let's talk launches, shall we? Yes. Yeah, I know Euclid just went up. Exactly. Now, John mentioned this in, in the interview that he didn't catch it at the time. I didn't catch it at the time either. You know what? This whole mission has gone completely under my radar. And and that just goes to show how much is going on right now. Yeah. Because out of nowhere, suddenly I'm, I'm seeing everyone post about this, this mission that's launching called Euclid. I'm like, I've not heard of this. What is it? And and it looks amazing. So this is uh, ESA. It's an ESA mission. And I've, they've launched on SpaceX. And obviously... That doesn't happen very often, or it hasn't happened at all, I don't think. Yeah, but that's that's quite rare. I think that's a first, yeah. And that will come on to my next story. But anyway, uh, they have sent this vehicle out to, or they're sending it to the Sun Earth Lagrange Point 2, which is about 1 million miles or 1.5 million kilometers away from our planet on the opposite side of the sun. So you may have heard of Lagrange Points when we talked about JWST before. Um, it's just an area where there's a, a, a kind of a gravity pocket, which somewhere somewhere can stay in a stable little orbit, which isn't really around the planet. It's just a little circular area where they can do stuff. And obviously, they're a little bit cooler out there because they're not right by a planet. And uh, the purpose of Euclid is to try and find evidence of invisible dark matter and dark energy and how it's shaping our universe. And that's just super heavy. <laughs> it is. Uh, to to quote Marty McFly. I hate to admit this. <laughs> I don't know a lot about this area scientifically. When when they start talking about dark matter, I'm like, uh, my brain just like shuts down. I'm like, yeah, it sounds awesome. I hate admitting that. But it's one of those things that is so like advanced for me that I'm like, that is crazy to me. Like, um, I really don't know a lot about it, yeah. which is sad. So um, it really sounds like something from science fiction, except it's not. It's real. They're looking for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'm really interested to see what kind of results this mission yields. And like I and I hate admitting it too. this one flew under my radar. Totally. Uh, I was so busy with other things. And I hate also hate saying this. There are so many SpaceX launches from the Space Coast, I have lost track of everything. There's just so much going on. I feel like there's a launch like once a week. Yeah, you know? well, there is. There, I mean, there. that's, that is, yeah, that is crazy to me. Like, that is nuts. I remember in, in 1985 when the space shuttle was going up, I think there was maybe, God, nine, eight or nine launches, I think. I probably had the number wrong, but there was, I think eight or nine shuttle launches that year. And that seemed like a lot. Like that was a lot of shuttle launches. And now it's like we're having a launch like once a week or something like that. And we're not having crude launches that frequently. But still, I mean, I want to say since Bob and Doug went up, I mean, we've had a lot of crude dragon launches. It's like the future is here almost. It's crazy. Yeah. So just to, to kind of follow up on that, SpaceX, and this is just SpaceX. This doesn't include the other companies that launch. Um, so far in, in 2023, I've had 45 launches, 42 Falcon 9s. Obviously, you've got Vandenberg and Florida now, uh, two Falcon Heavies and the, the one Starship launch. That's how many. And that's, and that's one launch every four four days, basically. Yeah, that's insane. So, you know, they, they're not far off from 100 launches in a year, which in fairness, I remember... Uh, one of our news stories was was that Elon said, well, we'll be at 100 launches a year soon, maybe next year, I think he said. And we were like, no, you won't. And we are not far off there. I, I mean, it's just crazy. Anyway, the other thing, uh, while we're talking about launches and the reason why ESA have had to use SpaceX for this is because they're, they're phasing out their Ariane 5 rocket, which is actually having its very launch, last launch. It's scheduled today as we're recording on the 5th of July, Wednesday the 5th of July. But obviously there can be delays in that. But the very last launch of this rocket is supposed to be today. But the good news is that Ariane 6, its replacement, they've actually got one on the test stand right now doing some engine tests. So we potentially aren't far away from uh, ESA having its next launch vehicle active, which okay. has been delayed. Um, and a lot, obviously that's a lot to do with um, what's been going on in Ukraine, Ukraine about these delays. 
Yeah. That, that to me are the two things that have caught my eye this week. Euclid and uh, the final Ariane, yeah. the build up to the final Ariane 5 launch. And and Space.com has done a top 10 launches, uh, the top 10 Ariane 5 rocket launches of all time. And I will put the, a link to that in the show notes because that uh, shows you some of the cool things that it did launch. Yeah, and it did launch a web, which was really yeah. cool. A lot of, I think that didn't happen long ago, but I think no. a lot of people forget that it, they launched the Webb Telescope. Absolutely. So, yep. very cool. Juice, Rosetta, cool. Herschel Space Observatory. Loads of things. It's re- really, 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 really cool. So, yeah, that's what's caught my eye this week. Never miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to leave a review. This is Space and Things. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us, as always. As we finish recording this, Emily and I are about to do the draw for this month's Facebook giveaway on our Patreon page. So if you're a member, be sure to check out this week's video, which will start with the draw to see if you've won. For those who are wondering what Patreon is, it's a membership service. We talk about it a lot, but it's a membership service which gives us the chance to try and earn some money from creating this podcast and also try and reward those who sign up. So depending on which level you sign up, you'll get some different rewards. And the book drawer is just one of the things we do, and we're hoping to do more and more for people who sign up for that. Uh, Podcasts are, of course, free to listen to, and we don't want to go down the advertising route, but it, it takes me a full working day each week to produce this podcast podcast and i've been doing it for lot for the love of it for the last three years but if you're willing and able to join our patreon then it'll give me a chance to perhaps earn something for it one day which would be really lovely yes next week's episode is episode 150 so if you're unable to join our patreon page please consider hitting the share button or leaving us a review on your podcast platform that all really helps us out too thank you for listening but don't forget in space no one can hear you me Thanks for listening to the Space and Things podcast. Back next Thursday with a brand new episode.